afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for being here today. I am Helena Bennett. I'm Head of Climate Policy at Green Alliance, and I'm really delighted to be welcoming you to this event that we are hosting uh, in collaboration with the Wildlife Trusts. Um, and we are going to discuss the state of adaptation to climate change in the UK this afternoon. Um, now, for any of you that have been keeping up with the news, you will have seen that the Prime Minister has resigned about half an hour ago. There's a lot of chaos going on in Westminster at the moment, so please do take this hour to grab yourself a cup of tea and sit back and listen to a calm and measured discussion with some experts about uh, the state of climate adaptation in the UK. Um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping. You can turn on closed captions um, if you'd like to at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, we do have a chat and Q&A function, so please do pop any questions into the Q&A and we will come back to those a little bit later. Um, and please do free, feel free to tweet about the event with the hashtag GA event as well. Um, I can't promise it'll get seen because if you've been on Twitter recently, it's just a kind of uh, big <laughs> chaotic group of um, memes and, and tweets about things that are going on down the road from us uh, here at Green Alliance. Uh, but please do tweet and, um, and do use the chat function as well. Um, so before we before we go to the panelists, um, why we're talking about climate adaptation in the UK. So uh, this year, 2022, we've seen multiple extreme weather records broken across the UK. We've had temperatures exceeding 40 degrees for the first time ever. July was the driest on, uh, record, on record in England since 1935. Um, and for some locations, the driest on record ever. We've had a tripling in the number of wildfires recently. Um, basically, climate change impacts are affecting many, many aspects of our society, from species extinction to breakdown of infrastructure that we use every day. And this really is just the beginning of extreme impacts um, that are going to continue to worsen. Um, and it's important to note that even if we did, by some absolute miracle, turn the taps off on fossil fuels completely tomorrow, the planet would continue to get warmer before it started cooling. So regardless of what happens from a mitigation point of view, adaptation is going to continue to be really important going forward and, and make no mistake the impacts of climate change are not going away anytime soon um, and then often not very well communicated either with the public especially in, in a country like ours. Um, adaptation is critically important to reducing the impacts from climate change and building resilience for the future for ourselves and for future generations but it's been massively deprioritized and pushed aside by successive governments in the UK. Um, the last nat national adaptation program, which you'll hear a lot more about this afternoon for England, uh, recently contained no new funding commitments and no new policies to actually help towards um, proper robust adaptation goals. Um, and this also means that the public don't really have a very good understanding of what adaptation is and businesses don't really know how to play their part and different governmental departments and priorities continue to develop policies that just might not be fit for a future um, as climate change continues to worsen. So we're really excited to be hosting this panel today um, and I'm delighted to say that we have some really brilliant adaptation experts on hand to delve into the detail a little bit more and answer any questions you might have. Um, so we have uh, Julia King, Baroness Brown of Cambridge and a member of the House of Lords. We have Catherine Brown from the Wildlife Trust. Peter Young from Green Purposes Company and Binyam Cabreas uh, from the IIED. Um, so I'm just going to head to the panelists one by one to give some opening remarks and then we'll pop back to the Q&A. So please do stick your questions in um, and yeah, enjoy. Over to you, Julia. Thank you very much indeed and apologies that I uh, I disappeared and have just reappeared. The internet here is just a wee bit uh, dodgy. So um, I chair the Adaptation Committee of the, the Climate Change Committee. So I'm um, really interested in this subject and delighted that, that the, uh, uh, the focus that we're now bringing to it, because adaptation is really the Cinderella of climate change. And, and bizarrely, um, net zero has almost seems to have made that worse, because I think too many people think that if we get to net zero, our problems are all solved. And, and one of the things we really do need to do is highlight to people how much change, even on a net zero global pathway, how much more change we're still going to see to 2050. And of course, much more change if we're not on that net zero pathway. So it's both adaptation and mitigation are critical. But in the UK by 2050, again, if the world's on a net zero path, we can expect about another 0.6 degrees of, 
of average warming, but of course maximum temperatures going up further and faster than that. Uh, we can expect that summers that could be as much as 24% drier. Think of the implications of that for wildfires after what we've seen this year. Um, winters that could be much, much wetter uh, and indeed more of that rain coming as very, very uh, intense, um, short but very intense period of very heavy rainfall. Um, the sort of thing that causes really bad surface water flooding, particularly as we concrete over our, our towns and cities. So, you know, there's, there's lots more, but people need to realise that um, even net zero implies a lot more change uh, than we've seen so far. So in preparing the evidence base for the third climate change risk assessment for the UK last year, and something for which Catherine Brown must take enormous credit as she led that as head of adaptation for the CCC in her previous role, um, 61 uh, potential risks and opportunities were looked at in some detail. Uh, and the conclusion was that, that almost 60% of those needed action now. And that compares with 46% um, five years ago when we did CCRA2. So I think a very strong message that risk is increasing faster in the UK uh, and I think globally, but risk is increasing faster than we are adapting or, or taking action. So 61 risks and opportunities is a lot for government to focus on in a short period of time. So the, the committee, the Climate Change Committee, uh, gave the government advice that there were eight risks on which it really did need to take action in the very short term. Uh, and in part, because those were very closely connected to policy development that was going on now that would last for a long time. And so, uh, you know, so we would uh, absolutely get serious regrets if we didn't build um, adaptation into that policy. And the first four of those um, risks relate to the natural environment. Uh, and the natural environment is critical in delivering net zero. We're going to rely on uh, quite a lot of uh, CO2 removal from the natural environment, from new forest and woodland planting. You know, we need to be restoring those peatlands. We need our soils to be in tip top condition. Delivering net zero um, needs us to be seeing um, uh, increased um, productivity on our farmland. Uh, it needs us to be able to plant trees that will grow and will live. Uh, so it needs our, our natural environment, environment to be in a truly healthy and resilient condition. Uh, and of course, we have elms being developed at the moment. And that's a one kind of a once in almost generation opportunity to make sure farmers and land managers are rewarded for doing the right things for the environment and for adaptation. The fifth risk was about um, climate risks to supply chains. And of course, actually COVID and, and um, the Ukraine war have, have flagged up how important uh, it is for us to think about supply chain risks. The sixth was about risks to the electricity system. Uh, as we move to net zero, uh, we uh, become more and more reliant on clean electricity to power our lives. Uh, at the moment, 15% of our energy comes from electricity. By 2050, it's more likely to be closer to 60%. Uh, but we saw this summer that we had to turn down nuclear stations because we hadn't the cooling water was too hot because of the weather. Uh, in, in Germany, they couldn't get coal barges down the Rhine because the river levels were too low. We might think that was a good thing. But <laughs> um, in the Scottish storm, uh, storms last year, there were a million people who had no electricity for a week because the electricity lines were brought down by snow and winds and falling trees and things. So as we become more and more reliant on electricity, it must be more and more resilient um, to the um, to the changing climate. And we have to build that in now whilst we're expanding the electricity system for net zero. We can't wait and do it do it later. And of course, the electricity system is, is usually the thing that causes cascading risks. So if the electricity goes, the water pumping goes, the communications go, your transport goes. So life grinds to a halt. We are going to be so dependent on it. Um, the, the next one of the risks we flagged up was heat and the, its effect on people. This summer, we've seen that, of course, uh, real extremes. Uh, and indeed, we already have early data that suggests we've had 3,000 excess deaths this summer in those periods of very hot weather in the UK. And finally, overseas risks are increasing um, with multiple impacts and, of course, things like impacts on our supply chains. So there's a little bit of good news, which is where we do have data um, and it's quite limited still on the um, ad adaptation investment. We see that the benefit cost ratios of adaptation are generally positive and quite often very high. 
Uh, the problem, though, is that there's quite often a wide range of beneficiaries from adaptation action. So it's hard to identify the who pays when you want to return on investment. So at the moment, the effective schemes we have tend to be those ones actually where the government pays and then people are prepared to invest. And that again brings us to things like ELMS and how crucial it is that we get the environmental land management scheme right um, so that farmers can invest in doing the right things for the environment and for adaptation. And so finally, we gave the government some advice on good adaptation policy. I'm not going to go through all the features, but crucially, we need a vision for what a well-adapted UK looks like, um, because then people and businesses will know what the government can do for them and what they need to do for themselves. And if we know what the end point is, we'll be able to measure progress. It'll be more like the net zero target where we can measure progress every every year and say we are progressing or we're not and at the moment we're not in that position so we we kind of have to comment on whether things that look as if they're good are happening rather than things that we know are making the kind of difference we need and as I hope you've got the message we need to integrate adaptation into all government policies and really do an adaptation check so that we're not um, so that we're we're building for the future basically uh, and we need to address inequalities because adaptation makes the poor poorer basically, not just in the global south, but here in the UK as well. So we're looking forward to a better um, third national adaptation programme uh, coming around the summer of next year, we expect. And we had been having very positive discussions with Joe Churchill, uh, our previous minister. But of course, with all of the changes going on, I fear we may have lost some of that. So um, we keep our fingers crossed. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Julia. Um, loads to unpick there. I'm looking forward to getting stuck into some of the detail. Um, really especially enjoyed all the kind of the different bits you listed around the really unexpected consequences of climate change in countries like the UK. I mean, you know, most people will know that we find it very difficult when leaves fall on train tracks, you know, let alone all the kind of really extreme weather events that we've started to see and will continue to see. So um, loads and loads to be thinking about. Um, Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much, Helena, and thank you, Julia, as well, for, for introducing the topic. Um, I'm Catherine Brown. I'm Director of Climate Change and Evidence at the Wildlife Trust. So I'm covering both climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, in this role and biodiversity loss as well. And really, obviously, for my short introduction, I, I wanted to focus on the links between climate change and nature in particular. And, and Julia has already mentioned some of these things. But if we think about what's happened this year, we've had we've just had an unprecedented hour in an unprecedented week. And we We've had an absolutely unprecedented year in terms of climate impacts as well. 40.3 degrees recorded in Lincolnshire. Two thirds of rivers this week in England are still below, well below the normal level of river flow for this year. And that's despite the heavy rain that most of us are having uh, today and this week. We've seen across Europe 600,000 hectares of land burnt. That's the second highest area burnt across Europe ever recorded. And we know about all of these risks. We included every single risk that we've experienced this summer in the climate change risk assessment, which Julie was just talking about. Three weeks before the extreme heat wave, heat wave we published our first wildlife trusts risk assessment of all of our habitats and nature reserves and all of these risks, extreme heat, wildfire, drought were all included. And we know this has been coming for some time, but the reason it's become quite so critical is partly because of the nature angle that we are in a climate and a nature crisis. And when you look at the statistics, they are quite frightening. So in 2021, CO2 emissions were the highest they've ever been recorded. And at the same time, a lot of you obviously work in adaptation day to day, I know, but the nature messages can sometimes get lost. The Living Planet Report, which was published this week by WWF, uh, showed a 70% drop in global wildlife populations since 1970. I mean, that's extraordinary. In the UK, 15% of, of species are at risk of extinction. None of our water bodies are meeting good chemical status. And we've seen really distressingly mass die-offs due to bird flu and wild bird populations. And the RSPB have reported this year, they think that tens of thousands of birds have died in that bird flu outbreak. And adaptation actually is the thing that brings all of these things together. Adaptation, particularly in the natural environment, and as Julia said, four of the, the top risks, half of the top risks in the, in the latest climate change risk assessment were about the natural environment. And adaptation, improving resilience in the natural environment is the thing that is going to help all of these crises that we're facing at the moment, all these interlinked crises with climate and biodiversity. 
what does that look like? Restoring and creating new habitats, connecting them together, reducing human pressures on wildlife. This is why the Wildlife Trust and other NGOs have been so vocal over the last few weeks about the increasing risks to nature in the UK from increased human pressure and growth. We really need as part of our complete adaptation response to be protecting our natural environment, you know, as an absolute national priority, not just something that gets thought about at the end of the day. The third thing I just want to say was we know what to do. We know what to do with adaptation. We just need to be doing much more of it. And we've got fantastic examples across the UK. So we're we're talking about a bit of a doom and gloom picture, but the, the real hopeful messages here are about the, the incredible projects that committed people are working on. I mean, just from the Wildlife Trust alone, we've got nearly 4,000 hectares of lowland fen, lowland peatland in the Great Fen Project being restored to wild fen. That's one of the largest peatland restoration projects in Europe. And that's a whole partnership of different agencies, different NGOs working to achieve that, which will help with water quality, with water shortages, with flood risk management, as well as biodiversity. Just another example, in Somerset, we've seen the creation of a supranational nature reserve this year, which is another 6,000 hectares of precious salt marsh, heath, wetland habitats that will help with sea level rise, will help with natural flood management and protecting carbon stores. And even in some of our very dry areas of the country, if you think about places like Suffolk that are particularly um, suffering from low river flows at the moment, we're planting trees along river banks, we're rebending rivers to make them more resilient. Um, and these things are happening at scale all over the country, and there are huge numbers of committed people helping to do that. But as we've already mentioned briefly, the funding gap is the really, really critical issue. So the Green Finance Institute estimate that there's a gap of at least £44 billion over the next 10 years. It could be as much as £97 billion to achieve the nature restoration goals that we want to see both for biodiversity loss, but for climate change adaptation as well. And achieving that funding app is going to be really critical to seeing if we can create the action at scale that we need to see to make sure we're taking adaptation seriously. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Catherine. Um, really great to hear about the kind of crossover with adaptation policies and, and the natural environment. Um, and I think important to note as well, I think we'll probably dive into this a bit later, um, that adaptation policies can also help with the mitigation problem. You know, there's lots of co-benefits from adaptation policies, simple things like insulating houses um, to reduce energy use actually can help in heat waves as well. Um, Peter, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, so asking about um, the finance role, which is uh, really the big problem, the funding gap. Well, we've got an awful lot to do. Um, I think the first thing I'd like to say is the UK isn't alone. I mean, globally, there's a massive shortfall in finance for adaptation. As much as six years ago, a UNEP said in their climate change adaptation finance gap report that we'd reach a gap of 140 to 300 billion dollars by 2030. And already, I think that's looking an optimistic figure. Um, probably the best current estimate globally comes from the Global Landscape of Climate Finance report produced last year, and that's 46 billion spent uh, compared with 180 billion dollars needed. But the thing I wanted to focus on is the fact that of that 46 billion that they estimate was spent, only 1 billion was private finance. So the 100 billion shortfall, which ain't going to come from the public sector, has to come from the private sector. That's a 100 fold increase over where we are now, an absolutely massive change. Yet, at the same time, on the optimistic side, the Global Commission on Adaptation estimated that there was $1.8 trillion of investment opportunities in five key areas of climate adaptation measures alone that would generate fourfold returns in less than 10 years. So the case for investment is there. It's just we don't have the policy and the uh, um, clarity to enable financial markets to, to mobilise. As Catherine's just said, we have got uh, an estimate of the finance gap for nature, and that overlaps massively massively with the finance gap here in the UK. Um, so I think that's probably the best guide that we have for the sort of 50 billion odd that we need until the end of this decade. But the visibility and integration of adaptation is still woefully absent. And I'll just give a couple of examples of that. Um, we've got a UK infrastructure bill uh, going through at the moment. Climate change adaptation is not specifically visible. As written, it's not enough for investment in the private sector to come into climate change adaptation as an asset class. And we're still way behind on buildings. Actually, the UK could have been in a leading position when we were in touching distance of delivering zero carbon homes in 2015, but George Osborne put 
paid to that. And currently, uh, the guidance from Future Homes is recognising the need for adaptation and mitigation, but we've lost 10 years and we've built 10 years of homes uh, which haven't addressed that. So how do we address it? Well, the first thing is to recognise that the financial world uses taxonomies and standards to describe what's being invested in. And that is a problem because it's defining the output, the thing that's built rather than how investment is to be designed. And it's how it's designed is where adaptation action is taken. In this sense, climate adaptation has a lot of parallels with nature positive and nature based solutions with resource efficiency and the circular economy. These are all focused on long term success and the long term outcomes of the investment, not on the cost to build and the capital value when the ribbon is cut, usually by a uh, smiling politician. Even while, even with the whole life cost, costing, you have problems because discount rates are often enemy number one in the financial business case for something which is looking at longevity. But without an adaptation lens, financial models are at risk from assuming a constant baseline for continuing to treat every impact of extreme weather as unlikely and isolated events and hence unforeseen. And we actually ultimately uh, risk losing the whole of the insurance industry as our safety net uh, against climate adaptation. So it's very important um, that funding now looks at adaptation and systemic risk. And it focuses not just on capex, but on targets based on what the long-term performance of the assets being uh, produced are. And in that sense, adaptation is largely an operating expenditure cost, not a capital it cost. And it's often the long-term asset owners, I think, who, own the, who hold the key here. Uh, and that's maybe something we can explore later, particularly regarding the asset owners of our land, which is where, of course, all our nature lies. I'll leave it there for now, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Um, I had never really thought about the kind of OPEX versus CAPEX um, discussion when it came to adaptations. So that's really interesting. We'd love to kind of dive back into that. Uh, just a reminder to everyone on the call to keep popping your questions in the Q&A box if you've got them. Um, and now over to Binyam. Thank you very much, Helena. Uh, you can hear me well. Uh, very pleased to be here uh, and really listen to some of the most interesting points. Uh, I will not be going into the, the points that have been raised, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief uh, in the interest of time. Uh, my name is Biniam, and I work with uh, the International Institute for Environment and Development. Uh, our role is to support the least developed countries in the climate negotiation space to ensure that their voices are heard uh, in this negotiation space and um, to ensure equity and um, and to ensure that their interests are heard in in what what could be a very uh, in, uh, difficult space to to navigate, uh, I, but because my experience is in the international climate negotiation space, my intervention would be uh, towards that. And uh, COP27 is going to be uh, in one of the most vulnerable uh, continents. Uh, which is which is Africa and Egypt, uh, and their adaptation is going to be a priority conversation at COP27. And looking at where UK is in all this, um, I think uh, the question uh, that was raised around UK's leadership at COP26 and 27, um, and in the past has always been uh, an area of conversation and my response would be UK is a very visible country, uh, especially uh, after Brexit, since the UK doesn't negotiate as, as the EU anymore, uh, UK is visible as a country on its own. Um, UK has been quite vocal in the adaptation space in the climate negotiation, which is, uh, which is quite a, a positive um, element. And uh, being the COP host, the COP26 host, uh, in the midst of, of COVID-19 uh, was a major profile builder for the UK. And uh, there are numerous success stories uh, that are raised around, around the UK's role in this, in this climate negotiation. But I would like to raise two points that I, I feel uh, does really tell, uh, send a positive signal in UK's, uh, UK's uh, leadership at the international level. The first one is, um, getting a consensus uh, amongst developed countries that uh, they have not delivered the 100 billion target uh, was 
was a challenge that UK's uh, diplomatic skill uh, has um, has managed to navigate. And uh, this is a step in the right direction because in the past there were conversations around whether or not the 100 billion target was met or not. But now at COP26 there was a there was a report uh, that came out uh, indicating that um, developed countries did not meet their target. I think this is a step in the right direction. And the second one is at COP26, there was a decision that urged developed countries to double their adaptation finance from the 2019 level to 2025. So this, uh, this for me, were kind of the highlights uh, of, of U UK's leadership. Uh, and UK is one, one of the, the, the lead supporters of the LDC initiative for effective adaptation and resilience. Uh, which is a flagship adaptation initiative of the least developed countries group at the UNFCCC. So it's quite important to give credit where credit is due. Uh, but I guess the, the great visibility comes with greater responsibility and also scrutiny, I guess. Uh, the, the, the backslide of UK's policy and action in the, in the past couple of uh, years on international climate finance and overseas development assistance um, has has been a major setback, and this is uh, this does uh, this does really send a, a negative connotation to the to the leadership we're referring to. And I think the most important element for me is uh, climate finance is not a charity; uh, it's a commitment. Uh, this commitment arises from two core principles. The first one is UK has a historic responsibility. And UK has the, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capability, or uh, what we commonly refer to as CBDR, where uh, we all have, all countries have um, common challenges, but their responsibility is dependent on their capability. So, in light of this two, uh, the commitment that UK puts in is not something that can be taken back depending on internal um, elements. So uh, I think there needs to be an understanding that climate finance is not a charity uh, because vulnerable countries ultimately are the ones suffering for the, for the impact they are not causing. Uh, their emissions are still low, uh, but uh, past and current emissions of countries like the UK and, and other developed countries does contribute to the, to, to the risk uh, that's being put on to uh, to developing countries and particularly least developed countries um, in shouldering the adaptation cost, which also leads to the loss and damage, which is uh, an unreversible damage. Uh, finally, yesterday at the 34th uh, Green Climate Funds uh, board meeting, uh, I think about uh, 13 projects were postponed, including one from least developed countries, because pledges and promissory notes were not met. And UK was one of the countries who did not uh, meet their commitments this year. So uh, my, my, my sense is all this high level political commitments and all these initiatives and all these commitments will only be as effective as the follow up action that the country uh, puts in. So for me, leadership is weighed in terms of action and in terms of support provided uh, to, to developing countries, particularly least developed countries, uh, there are some promising elements, but uh, if not seen through, it would just be another pledge. Thank you, Helena. Great, thank you. Um, really glad you mentioned the kind of climate justice angle there um, of, of the, the, who's been the historic emitters and where the impacts of climate are hitting hardest first. Um, I think it's, really important as we talk about adaptation in the UK to keep being cognizant of the fact that we aren't facing impacts anywhere near as um, intensely as lots of other parts of the world who in general have, as you said, Binyam, emitted much less than us. Um, I'll, I'll, I'd like to come back to you first, Binyam, on a, on a question we've had in the, in the Q&A um, and that I'm interested in as well um, before we go to other panelists. And that's on the... Um, the kind of risk to the net zero agenda. So for those of us that work in the climate space, um, we understand that adaptation is needed as a consequence of climate change. Um, but when we communicate that to the public, I do think there's a real risk um, in how we 
make sure that uh, mitigation isn't seen as the kind of loser in the situation and doesn't put the net zero transition at risk. Um, the, the obvious narrative is, oh, you know, we should, mitigation hasn't worked. We haven't been able to reach net zero. Climate change is coming anyway. Everyone's telling us to adapt. We might as well give up trying to keep going with the transition. Um, so I'm interested to hear from you, Benyal, about the kind of international perspective and, and what the mood might be like um, outside of the UK uh, in terms of, you know, making sure that the net zero and adaptation happen together. Um, and then we'll come to some of the other panellists that are kind of more UK focused. Thanks. Uh, I, I think that's a very important question. Uh, there seems to be a consensus around uh, the, the less we mitigate, the more we have to adapt. Um, that's, that's the reality. Um, we are looking at adaptation needs be based on past and current emissions. So unless we, we limit our trajectories uh, nationally, uh, as indicated in our national determined contributions, then it's very likely that we, we, we will have more, uh, more needs uh, the, of adaptation and also it could possibly lead to uh, uh, loss and damage. A very practical example that I can uh, provide in, in, in a developing country context is, uh, for instance, Ethiopia is, is one of the coffee growers uh, where with 1.5 degree, which is the agreed ambitious plan of the of the Paris Agreement could could likely cause the, the taste of Arabica to, to be lost in its entirety and two to three degree could totally wipe out coffee production and we can we can look at the the economic impact the the all the elements that come into uh, and that could lead to migration um, conflict and and a lot of other elements and we are seeing a lot of land uh, being lost in many small island developing countries because because of sea level rise so the the emissions are linked to adaptation action the, the, these are not things we can separate and see and as you say there is that strong linkage with uh, of of the mitigation action reflecting directly on on the cost and nature of the adaptation needs brilliant thank you um catherine did you want to come in there yeah, I'll, I'll give this a go from a UK angle. Um, and it's something, I mean, it's I've worked in adaptation for um, nearly 20 years, probably on and off. And it's something I've heard the whole way through working, working on adaptation. And particularly you hear it from um, colleagues, for example, officials in base who are very focused on international mitigation, that we can't talk about adaptation too much, as you say, because it detracts from the need to mitigate. And actually, the, the way I've started to get around it is, is just to say, actually, yes, adaptation means we have failed on mitigation, but it's not future mitigation, it's mitigation that we haven't done in the past. And that is why we have got climate change now that we are having to adapt to. So you can still talk about it without even going into future um, trajectories uh, of mitigation, global mitigation commitment. The other problem is we tend to see um, uh, bodies like the the Global Warming Policy Foundation using the line that we just we can just adapt. We don't need to 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 deal with all this mitigation stuff, and that's very that's a real distraction. Obviously, um, it's making mischief, and it's completely and utterly untrue. We you know we we've seen it this year. We have unprecedented impacts now that we need to adapt to. That does not detract any at all any bit from from the need to meet our our commitments under the Paris Agreement. So to to try and pitch adaptation and mitigation against each other is just a completely false dichotomy. So, and I think we as the adaptation community have a real responsibility to make sure that those messages are correct um, and that we that we push back against any of this mischief making that goes on with the with the two topics as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. I, tot I totally agree. Um, so message to everyone listening to this. Um, that, that's your takeaway, that's your homework to take away is don't separate adaptation and mitigation from each other. Um, Peter, there's a question for you here in the Q&A um, about the five key areas that you mentioned to produce the fourfold returns in investment from the private sector. Are you able just to elaborate on, on those a little for us? OK, yeah. Um, what's interesting is that they're um, pretty well evenly split between uh, the, uh, the rural natural environment and the um, urban environment. Uh, the five areas are um, disaster prevention, uh, which is perhaps the most obvious one, but where you can actually predict you're going to have uh, disasters happening, whether that be protection of uh, um, uh, you know, sea level rise or, or, or storms or, or whatever, um, actually going in and putting preventative work in before that happens. We all know that's much better than actually dealing with a mess afterwards. Um, 
straightforward infrastructure, resilient infrastructure, adaptation designed infrastructure. That's actually the biggest ticket item. Um, there's resilient cities, which encompasses a whole range of things, but broadly around bringing green space into cities, sustainable urban drainage design and changes in uh, building materials and building, uh, bringing in uh, passive uh, heating and cooling of, of buildings. And then the other two areas are food security and agriculture. And th those two go very much uh, together. Um, and we could have a whole debate about that area, but I do want to raise it in terms of um, climate change. Uh, adaptation. Our ability to adapt is really important when it comes to uh, designing our future agricultural systems. Um, Julia mentioned there the importance of elms. Uh, the transition we've got in the UK, the opportunity we have, we get it right, will be tremendous, both from the point of view of mitigation and adaptation in terms of climate, but also in terms of food security, in terms of nature restoration, and in terms of soil health. Um, but at the moment, we're seeing precious little attention to that holistic solution. Um, and that is actually seen as one of the areas. I mean, just as an example, on my day job with the um, uh, Green Purposes Company, um, Macquarie have the biggest agriculture, sustainable agriculture investment um, part in their business, which is entirely based in Australia. And that's only come out of the need to manage water far more efficiently as the whole of the Murray-Darling Basin began to dry up. And that's actually led to all sorts of technologies in sustainable agriculture, um, which would actually be really useful across many other drought stricken areas. Excellent, thank you, that was, that was very concise. And um, Julia, did you wanna come in there? Uh, yes, if I could just um, in a way reinforce things that, that Peter was saying. I mean, I think as he says, in, in terms of the infrastructure area, um, the, um, actually, it's quite easy to do the right things to get to start to bring in um, investment. Um, there's a really crucial role for our regulators like Ofwat and Ofgem, which I think we're not seeing being they don't we don't see them having strong enough powers. Um, you know, if they are able to demand higher resilience standards from the electricity um, system players, from the water players, um, then. Uh, there will have to be investment, you know, that there will that will be essential for people to continue their business. So the regulators and the concept of resilient standards, I think, is very important. But also um, other areas of regulation like like building standards. Um, we have finally seen a ch the change that the CCC has been uh, fighting for ever since Catherine started with us. Um, we have finally seen the change to um, building regs for new homes to um, bring in an overheating um, requirement. But um, if we can get the mortgage lenders lined up with that, such that um, mortgages on properly green and sustainable homes become cheaper and the value of those homes starts to be differentiated from the other houses on the street, then actually people will see the value of their own assets going up when they take the right steps, whether that's property level flood resilience or whether that's um, the right kind of um, um, ventilation and shading uh, in order to uh, in order to give them resilience to the hotter weather. So I think in the infrastructure area, we've got plenty of levers that governments and others can use um, to get the investment in adaptation. Um, the more challenging area, of course, uh, is and, the, and in a way the very crucial area is the natural environment. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'd like to stick with you, Julia. Actually, and um, you mentioned in your opening remarks about the fact that we don't as a as a country or and globally i think but but in the uk in particular have a kind of vision for adaptation and i think it's it's really difficult to build that when the goal posts are constantly changing on adaptation because we're often you know we see the impacts of climate change in ways we weren't expecting i don't think anyone was predicting over 40 degrees in the uk this year um, and the science is always changing as we reach various different tipping points in the kind of global um atmosphere so i'd love to hear a little bit from from each of you and we'll start with you julia about how how we can start to build up a vision for what adaptation looks like so i think it's going to be really important for communicating down right down throughout throughout society in the uk well i think, I think you've used the right words um build up a vision because i think it's a top down and a bottom up process um i think the government has some things to do around resilient standards around what the expectations of of the public and of business uh, should be so around um, making you know what what um, types of um, climatic conditions are 
energy system and our whatever should be resilient to. And of course, they're going to be more or less the, the, the central predictions of the climate models, um, not the extremes, but we need to, we need to understand um, when we can expect to be protected and indeed when emergency response, what sort of events emergency response um, will have to come in for. Um, I think we need more painting of pictures, more of a, a storytelling approach so that people can understand the kinds of things that could happen. But I also think we need that coming up from community and town and city level um, and government needs to be supporting our, our towns and our cities uh, in developing those visions of what does a, a resilient environment look like for them. Because of course, the, the, um, the conditions in terms of the um, how wealthy people are, the type of land that they're on, the actual local weather impacts they have are all so different that actually any response to adaptation has to be local and people have to be engaged in thinking about what is the place they want to live in, what's it going to be like. So it, it's, it's a challenging thing to do. It's not like just giving you a number in the global environment that in the, in the global atmosphere that we can all aim for. Um, and it does need much more engagement with the public so that people understand the implications of climate change and what the climate, what the changing climate means could look like in terms of weather events in 30 or 40 years time. And I, I think that would wake people up to the fact that we need much more action than we've got at the moment. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Um, and communication of climate mitigation and adaptation is something I think successive governments have failed to do properly. It's a it's a real kind of art of storytelling of bringing people along on the journey and explaining why certain things are happening and the co benefits that it will bring. Um, so again, everyone else in this call is now getting a second piece of homework to start doing that more as well in your work. Um, Binyan, did you want to come in on the kind of building a vision for adaptation? I don't know if there's any kind of lessons that you've come across on the international space that. UK could start drawing on to build up a, a vision of what we think adaptation policy should look like. Thanks. Uh, I think one one point I would like to add uh, would be <clears throat> uh, we can't no more keep throwing money at the problem because uh, money is becoming scarce. Uh, so that scarcity should lead us to proper planning. And uh, some of the lessons that have been uh, that have been sent to developing countries, to uh, least developed countries, maybe it's time to invest those lessons at home, like locally laid adaptation might be something to consider internally, ensuring that it's locally driven and priorities are set and decentralizing some of the thinkings and financing might be something to consider. Uh, at the end of the day, under adaptation, what we're doing is we are, uh, we are thinking about risk a risk per degree of risk that we are uh, we could likely land um, in in certain risks so uh, our investments shouldn't necessarily be about uh, about profits but about reducing the risk and ensuring that the local communities do have a say on not just on the planning but on the financing on where the investment needs to happen uh, it it the top down elements of the national adaptation plan and visioning uh, can happen as well as the the bottom up uh, the bottom up element of selecting the investment areas and selecting where uh, high risks uh, are can be reduced could could be uh, things to consider Excellent, thank you. Um, Catherine, we'll come to you. I think you've got some kind of good examples and case studies of, of programmes that are doing really good things on kind of building up a, a good picture and a story. Yeah, just very briefly, it's worth mentioning that um, I think DEFRA may surprise us a little bit on this one with the next national adaptation programme, because I know they've been doing a huge amount of work to think about visioning for, for the third programme for England. Um, and we're still waiting for the results of a public dialogue on adaptation to be published. And that's that's um, that's no secret. It's on the government website that, that this public dialogue has been underway. Um, and, a, and a chunk of that work was doing this bottom up exercise to talk about vision. So that's one thing to look out for in the future. And just one other thing to mention is we, we do a lot across the Wildlife Trust with community engagement on adaptation visions. There's a really nice example, again, from Somerset, um, as part of the Adapting the Levels project, where they've done a huge community engagement, visioning, um, storytelling, illustration exercise to talk about what the Somerset levels might look like in the future. 
uh, and that uses the RAD framework, which again, attendees may be very familiar with, which is an emerging one, um, which stands for resist, accept, direct, I think. I'll just put a link in the chat if anybody wants to have a look at that example in particular, but it's a, it's a really nice one. Great, thanks, Catherine. Um, Peter, we've, we've got a question in the chat about the different scenarios and, and climate when it comes to climate risks um, and, this, and the CCC and IPCC's different scenarios that they have projected. Um, and the question is, um, how can asset owners factor in these this variety of climate risk in insurance, given the diverse range of scenarios out there and reporting metrics? Um, and should the worst case scenario be included, even if it may result in sunk costs? Thank you. Um, well, the first thing I would say is that important, the whole point about scenarios is to do stress testing, if you like, under different circumstances. So, of course, you should include the worst case and you should look at what the consequences are. It doesn't mean that that's the only case that you plan for, but you've got to look at what the balance of risk and reward are, if you like, for addressing those. There will be additional costs to deal with a more certain future, um, but you shouldn't equally uh, not consider um, how the wide range of uncertainty affects your, your project. What tends to arise out of that is an ability to favor technologies and solutions and approaches. Um, and in, in an adaptation terms, very often these are nature-based solutions, which are much more resilient and much more able to, um, to cope with those more extreme uh, examples. And that is really what we need to drive from that scenario testing is a choice not of, um, if you like, uh, one hit wonders, which are very cost effective as long as everything goes perfectly to plan, but are hopeless as soon as things go a little awry to things which are much more resilient and which actually can cope with a variety of uncertainties that we have ahead. And given what uh, we're talking, what Catherine was saying about, you know, the adaptation we're dealing with now is what we've already caused. We still don't know how much we're going to cause in the future, and it'd be very unwise to back on uh, to back only one scenario. You have to look at that range of scenarios and then come up with solutions um, and finance and favour finance solutions so that the cost of capital for those drops because they are the more resilient ones. Brilliant, thank you. And um, there's, there's a really good question in the chat that's that's been on my mind as well about thinking about adaptation from a kind of public health point of view. Um, the question in particular is about wildfires on local community health, but um, and, and I assume that um, pertains to a few different aspects, including kind of respiratory problems that arise. Um, but I, but I mean, climate impacts more generally, and we've seen this. Uh, globally and in different areas that are being impacted um, primarily by climate change, that it really is a big public health problem. Um, are any of the panelists able to speak a little bit more about the, the health point of view? Um, I know none of, no one's really talked about it yet. So um, Julia, yeah, please go ahead. I think well, of all the areas where we can, we can demonstrate um, that uh, adaptation has benefits, the, uh, the benefits to, to health are, are some of the ones that are, are in a way, easiest to um, uh, to quantify and to make a case that the investment is a good thing. You know, the benefits to to people's health if they have um, homes that are, are livable in in the summer. The benefits to people's health if they can sleep at night. I mean, we know that periods where um, we get very high nighttime temperatures cause um, terrible problems with sleep, and the sleep impacts on health are very very significant. Um, particularly for, for the young and the elderly, but actually for everybody. And of course, businesses should be worried about the productivity impacts on people trying to work from home in, in really hot conditions or people working who, who haven't slept very well. Um, and of course, the excess deaths, we can sadly put, you know, put some financial numbers on. We can also put numbers on the value of that green space that, that was being talked about in our towns and cities, the values to mental health, the values to health um, of people taking more exercise as well as the cooling effect on the urban heat island um, impact. So there are quite a lot of, of the health as aspects that we can start to put numbers on. And those are actually some of the biggest numbers we get in terms of the benefits of taking adaptation action. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's been a few different questions in the chat that are kind of under a, under a similar theme of um, actually getting action done. Um, so one on kind of actually getting government to act instead of... Um, going back on previous policies and commitments, um, does the panel think 
groups like XR and Just Stop Oil detract from good work or can they help um, get adaptation taken more seriously? Um, someone saying that they've kind of done lots of different bits and pieces of action and just are still feeling like they haven't um, managed to have big breakthroughs. So I'm, I'm keen to hear, Catherine, maybe we'll come to you. And, and I don't know if you've got any thoughts because there's a reference to, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen the question, um, does, does the World Wide Trust, et cetera, need to shout positive messages um, louder? Um, I mean, I, I think from an outside point of view, I feel like you guys do talk, obviously, <laughs> having you in post as well is very helpful, but you do talk about these things, but, but maybe it's not kind of penetrating through to the wider public enough in ways that Kind of big stunts do so i'm interested to hear if you've kind of got any views on how we really push this right up the agenda from a political point of view yeah sure and i suppose i i have an interesting perspective having started my career in government moved to the climate change committee and then to an ngo to the wildlife trust and obviously the the way in which we engage with government and with the general public is is massively different you know we're much we're a much more public facing organization in the wildlife trust than the ccc can be under its remit for example but different organizations have different roles. I mean, charities like ours have, have charitable objectives. We have um, rules and regulations set by the Charity Commission about things like direct action. And by direct action, I, I mean sort of direct protest, if you like. Um, that's not something we would get ever get involved with. But we, we do have quite a loud voice and we have been using it over the past few weeks in particular, um, not so much on the climate adaptation side, but certainly on the, the nature side. Um, and NGOs can, can, can collaborate on those sorts of big messages. And you may have seen a lot of that happening recently as well. I think there is, there is a role for all of those different types of action. Um, we can get into a debate as to whether gluing yourself to a building or not is a good idea, but you know that it it does have an effect that people do hear those messages. Um, and the other thing I would say is that everybody can do something. So what what we would always say is that there is a list of of things that everybody should be doing. You should all know if you're living in a flood risk area. Nobody should be buying peat-based compost. And one of the really positive things that we saw happen uh, this autumn was, was the ban finally coming in after decades of advocacy on this to ban peat in, in sales of um, uh, amateur horticultural compost from 2024, but never buy peat compost. Um, use water wisely, reduce your water use, know if you're at risk of extreme heat based on your home and your office and understand the measures you can take. There's loads of stuff on the Wildlife Trust website you can look at as well. That's all really important. But but from an NGO perspective, I would say write to your MP. Everybody should be writing to the new minister at DEFRA or whoever the next new minister at DEFRA is going to be about adaptation. If you haven't yet, then why not? We should all be doing that. And that's something that we would advocate very strongly from the Wildlife Trust to do. Brilliant. Thanks, Catherine. Um, Binyam, I'd like to come back to you. I don't know if you're heading to COP27 in Egypt. Um, you are. Brilliant. Um, how do you think we can use COP27 to continue raising the profile of adaptation and, and loss and damage in particular on the kind of international stage? Thanks. Uh, I, I think the first thing would be to follow up on the commitments, because uh, a lot of political statements come up every year. Uh, but uh, less action and less uh, seeing through the, the commitment. So uh, I guess uh, as, as, as the UK, as a, as a government, as a past presidency as well, they, they are positioned best to mobilize uh, not just commitments, but also action. The first one would be uh, to, to fulfill UK's commitments. Uh, those commitments need to be fulfilled, and then mobilizing others to fulfill those commitments. And the, the first one would be the doubling of adaptation finance. The, the concern has always been focus on mitigation, the focus on uh, mitigation projects and, and not investing on adaptation because it's too risky, even though what we're trying to do is reduce the risk. Um, to balance that, the, there is a decision, and we're hoping to see more commitments coming out. Uh, I guess the, the global response on adaptation can uh, can really help clarify what the, what global goal on adaptation could look like. That's that's the current discussion uh, on on the on the table, and hopefully that will help help us understand where the globe the direction of travel of the world in terms of adaptation. Where are we, and where are we going? And to this, I think the global stock take would be a very good asset. Um, the country's communication on adaptation is quite critical so that we have an understanding of where we are in progress uh, and UK uh, uh, 
needs to develop its national adaptation plan and communicate and also report back on its uh, on its uh, adaptation action so that uh, others could learn, but also UK in, in the next iteration of their national adaptation plan would also revise that plan. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we're not heading to COP, um, but we will be watching from afar, so best of luck while you're there. Um, we've got time for just one more question, I think. So just to wrap up, um, and we'll kind of combine these with closing statements, um, I'd love to hear from each of you if you could introduce one big adaptation policy in the next 12 months that you think is going to make a really big difference, what would it be? Um, Peter, let's start with you. Okay, well, I'll pick a simple one. I would make uh, adaptation a um, requirement of the um, National Infrastructure, UK Infrastructure Bank, make it a specific objective. Um, I think that would be helpful. Brilliant. That was, that was lovely and short and sweet. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Julia. Well, we'd like to see government um, taking adaptation into account in every new policy it comes up with, um, just as it should do for net zero. But I'd also like to see an initiative where um, big companies um, with supply chains uh, actually sign up to make a commitment to help their suppliers adapt, rather than um, reducing your risk by saying, oh, we'll get our coffee from here, but we'll also get our coffee from um, another country, actually making a commitment to work with their coffee growers um, to fund them um, to adapt. You know, these would not be huge amounts of expense, but that should be seen as part of your ESG, that you're not um, reducing risk by having multiple suppliers, you're committing to the, in the countries where they need it, to really helping them to change. Brilliant. Yeah, I love that idea. It, you know, people kind of choose more sustainable products if they've got a little tag on them or something, don't they? So that could kind of fit into that, you know, whether it's labelling or, or good communication or something. Um, Binyam, let's come to you. Your one policy. Thanks. Uh, I was going to say uh, restore back uh, ODA cutbacks from the government, but uh, uh, Julia's idea is so great. So I will I will second that suggestion on the on the coffee support. <laughs> Great. Um, and Catherine, with you finally. Oh, I, I, it's really hard to have this one. I've got about 20, but um, reinstating support services for local authorities, for businesses, for charities like ours. Um, this is something that Green Alliance and, and we wrote to the new minister about last week, and it's absolutely essential for local action. Adaptation is such a local issue. Local communities know best what needs to be done and having that support service in place, which has sadly been stripped away over the last 10 years, I would absolutely love to see that reinstated. Brilliant, thank you. That's that's a great one to end on. And there was a question about local authorities in the chat that we didn't get around to because I, I actually thought it would open up a whole um, other discussion that I would love to have one day. Um, thank you so much to all of our panellists, um, to Julia, Binyam, Peter and Catherine. Really, really great to have you here. Thank you very much from Green Alliance and the Wildlife Trust. I really hope you've enjoyed this discussion. It's been nice and calming and now you can all get back to the chaos of, of the real world in Westminster. Um, do keep following our work of all our organisations um, and if you have any further questions then please do reach out to us. Um, apologies we didn't get around to answering them all. Um, but a really good discussion and have a lovely afternoon everybody.